Good afternoon. Welcome. Is everyone sitting comfortably, including us? Um, I'm Bronwyn Maddox. I'm director of the Institute for Government. Delighted to have you here for this in conversation with the Speaker of the House of Commons, John Burko. He needs really almost no introduction, but let me just say a few things. He was elected Speaker, as you know, in 2009. He's the first Speaker to have been elected, first, first since the Second World War, to have been elected to that post three times. And um, it came to, um, it came, first came to Parliament as the Conservative MP for Buckingham in 1997 and then got into the shadow cabinet in uh, 2001. There's a long-standing in interest in Burma, which um, I, I'm also interested in, or Myanmar, which we're not interested in, we're not uh, talking about today, but I have a personal interest in. He won the Stonewall Award for Politician of the Year in 2010 for his work to support LGBT equality and the Channel 4 Hansard Society Political Award for Opposition MP of the Own 2005. That's going back a bit, but still the uh, plaudits are there. Um, I wondered right at the it was a very, very lively period in Parliament. There is much to talk about. But I wondered if just right at the start of this, you could give us a flavour of what you set out to do when you took this post. Thank you, Bronwyn, for your introduction and for having me here today. And congratulations to the Institute for Government on the incredibly important work that it has done and is doing. And I want to wish you great success in your tenure. In answer to your opening question, I set out really to achieve three objectives. To increase scrutiny and the opportunity for backbench representation. To modernise outside of the chamber as well as inside it the working of the house in such a way as to try to make it more family friendly principally in the first instance through the introduction of a nursery on the parliamentary estate which members of parliament and staff could pay for and thirdly I said to the house if you elect me in addition to the traditional duties of the office, which I'll do my best to discharge, I would like to add one further component, namely that within limits, and subject of course to the requirement of political impartiality as between the parties, the Speaker can and should become an ambassador for Parliament and a robust advocate of democratic politics. At that time, it was already in my mind that if elected, I would discharge that duty by getting out and about, visiting schools, colleges, universities, faith groups, charitable institutions, public bodies of one sort or another, to talk about how Parliament operates, why it matters, in what ways we're changing, and what the Speaker does. And if I may say so on a very light-hearted note, I should say to you that a few months after I was elected Speaker, quite a senior colleague who in a million years wouldn't have voted for me to become Speaker, came up to me in the chair and said, Mr Speaker, I didn't vote for you. I voted for Sir George Young because I think he's a bloody good egg. But I'm bound to say, sir, I do think we're doing jolly well, if I may say so. We're standing up for the rights of the House and increasing scrutiny in this place. And it's absolutely right and proper. Well done. But can I just make my point? And I said, please do. And he said, this sort of, you know, outreach business. And I said, forgive me, please explain. Sort of, you know, visiting schools and, 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 and universities and, 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 and so forth. Well, I mean to say. And I said, well, what do you mean to say? <laughs> well, I think it's a rum business. <laughs> he said. And I said, what do you mean? And it took quite a long time for him to articulate his point, but he eventually said to me, well, I have to say, I think it's rather below stairs, if I may say so, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> I mean, you know, if people want to know what the Speaker does, they'd bloody well come to the House of Commons and watch the proceedings of the House in action and the Speaker in the chair. But I mean, I really don't think the Speaker should be going sort of visiting schools and, and universities. Uh, if you don't mind my saying so, sir, he said it's frankly rather beneath the dignity of the office. And I said to him, I completely respect you being so direct and just telling me candidly, that you think I'm wrong to do this, but I completely disagree with you because I think we're in a different age and the idea that you can just sit in 
your chair, dress up in a fancy uniform, look important and expect to be respected is for the birds. I'm in a public office which is paid for and I think I've got to make a case, not just or even principally for myself, but for the institution that I try to represent. So whether I'm any good a speaker is not for me to say, that's what other people judge. I obviously think I can do the job and presumably Parliament does, otherwise it wouldn't have re-elected me a number of times. But in the end, no person can be judge in his or her own cause. That's for others to decide. But I have tried to do, friends and colleagues, what it said on the tin, and that's what I intend to go on doing. All right, well, thanks very much indeed for that. Though, yeah, I know you're in danger of parodying the party to which you belong before you became speaker and doing them a few favours, but I'll leave it to them to make those points. <laughs> Not enough. Listen, let's go. It is, as I said, an exceptionally lively time in Parliament at the moment. And um, I want to ask you, whether, given what you've said, whether you think the Speaker has a role in uh, securing Parliament's role in scrutinising Brexit. I think that the Speaker does have a role. I don't think it should be exaggerated, but the Speaker has a role basically in seeking to ensure that government policy pronouncements expenditure, declared negotiating tactics are the subject of questioning and scrutiny in the chamber. And therefore, Bronwyn, in essence, what that means is it is for the Speaker to try to maximise participation in questions to the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union. Sure, that almost goes without saying that there is a session of that character every five or six weeks as part of the question cycle and I'm always looking to ensure that as many people contribute as possible but I think beyond that it's for the speaker if and when the government doesn't proffer statements to the house and updates to ensure that there is the means to secure such statements or updates and what that essentially means colleagues as some people here will know and others might not is the Speaker has a role in granting urgent questions. I think we've had 383 in my tenure to date, and I rather imagine there'll be more. Though I must say, in <coughs> fairness, David Davis, who was an extremely diligent and independent-minded backbencher for many years before he became Secretary of State for Brexit, has set out on a path of saying, I will update the House whenever... I think it necessary to do so. So he has taken the lead on that front, but if for some reason he didn't, or if, to be honest, there was a genuine difference of opinion and he thought something wasn't urgent and didn't require scrutiny, and other colleagues thought that it was urgent and did, it would fall to me to decide whether mm. to allow mm. such a debate. The other respect in which the Speaker has a role is in the selection of amendments, though it is only fair to say, and if I didn't, the clerks would quickly correct me, ladies and gentlemen, that where the committee stage of a bill is concerned, that role falls, selection of amendments to the chairman of Ways and Means, the senior deputy speaker. So when we have the committee stage on the European Union withdrawal bill, selection will not be a matter for me, but when the bill gets to report stage, selection will be a matter for me. So do I take that responsibility seriously? Absolutely. I think all points of view must be aired. The Speaker should take care to be fair, of course, to people on both sides of the House and to people expressing all sorts of different points of view. And I suppose the only thing I would say, which I doubt would be contradicted, is that you know I've not shown myself reluctant over the years to select amendments for debate and vote, which may not be for the convenience of the executive, but which are in the interests of the House, and would, I think, on the whole, be expected or at any rate welcomed by most people across the country. Well, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you. We know, um, as we know, there's a ton of amendments now been tabled <laughs> with, with the draw bill, which now goes into a committee stage. Can you give us a, a hint of, of what kind of thing you think is legitimate to pick out when, when it comes to report stage? I think that's very difficult. I think it rather depends on what happens at committee stage. But look, there are certain issues that keep coming up. The rights of EU citizens, the question of those parts of the bill 
that are the subject of what are described as Henry VIII's powers, that is to say, very, very strong, some would say sweeping powers for the government to act on a particular matter without further reference to Parliament. Now, those matters may be the subject of amendments when we get to report stage, if they haven't already been adequately dealt with at committee stage. There may be amendments relating to economic arrangements post-Brexit or pending Brexit, and those matters may need to be debated. I mean, I don't start from the mm, position mm. of saying, well, some can be, but others are too contentious mm. or too toxic. Nothing is too toxic for Parliament to consider. But I come back to the point, you know, I know it's blindingly obvious, and forgive me, I don't want to be boring, but it is important. It's not for the Speaker to take a view on the merits or demerits of a particular course of action, but it is, I think, for the Speaker, when it falls to the Speaker, to exercise his duty fully and conscientiously to ensure that Parliament can have its say. And, you know, I think it's demonstrably clear that I've erred on the side of granting more debate and more opportunity mm -hmm. rather than less debate and mm -hmm. less opportunity. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to ask you too much more about Brexit, but just, just stepping back, do you think that referendums are easily compatible with a parliamentary system? They're not incompatible with a parliamentary system. It's perfectly possible to have a referendum from time to time. And I don't believe that the holding of a referendum does violence to parliamentary democracy. I do think it helps if the rationale for a referendum has been very fully thought through. I think, Bronwyn, I am probably on the record somewhere some years ago as saying that I could see an argument for a referendum on the EU. And put very simply, the argument was this. It's not original, it's rather a prosaic point, but I think it's a valid one. The major parties for which read Conservative, Labour and Lib Dem at the time that I was making this point, though of course it could apply to the SNP, were all in favour of continued membership of the European Union. There was by any standard a substantial proportion of the public who took the opposite view, but a general election was not a means by which the issue could be resolved, precisely because all the major parties were in favour of continued membership. So I could see an argument for saying that if Britain's membership was somewhat unstable in the sense that it was the subject of constant controversy and contradiction, one way to put the issue to bed, and perhaps a very good way to put the issue to bed, would be to hold a referendum. However, I leave you to judge whether this referendum was called on that basis, and some of you may think it was, others of you may think that it was called as a means by which to facilitate effective party management or the crowding out of another political force. It seems to me that the former argument for a referendum is compelling and the latter argument less yeah. so. However, these were judgments, to be fair, for Prime Minister Cameron to make not for me to make. If you're asking me generally, am I a great enthusiast for referenda, the honest answer is no. I believe in parliamentary democracy. I remember once going, Bronwyn, to the 20th anniversary celebrations of independence in Slovenia. And it was, in a way, a great celebration of the fact that they'd emerged from the communist yoke and they had a democratic system. However, they had made the mistake of, I think, enshrining, if memory serves me correctly, in their constitution, provisions which lent themselves to quite frequent referenda on issues that were politically awkward in Parliament, but which most people wouldn't think warranted a referendum. Things like spending cuts, or possibly nuclear power, or something like that. Now, would I favour referenda on those matters? Absolutely not. We have parliamentary democracy and mm. government through Parliament. So that's my no, that, 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 is, that is what I was getting at. Um, okay. No, do I yeah, favour yeah, that? No. Yeah. I would just say in, uh, on the subject of, you know, the, the Prime Minister's at the time, as I mm. referred to him, I do think that David Cameron's decision to step down when the referendum was lost was a very honourable one. I mean, there have been some people mm. who've criticised, and I've sometimes met Conservative supporters 
supporters of mine in my own constituency who said, oh, we, you know, we rather like Mr Cameron, we think it's a pity he stood down. Mm. I mean, to be fair to David, he was decisive about it, you know, and he had put with very considerably greater force the argument for staying in in a way that Harold Wilson had done so much more timidly back in 1975. And having taken such a strong position and got the opposite result, I think he thought, well, the honourable thing to do was to walk away and, you know, whatever else people might criticise him for. I personally don't really think people should criticise him for that. Mm. No, well, well th thanks for offering that. Okay, let, let's, let's, let's set Brexit aside for the moment at, the, at that point and go to the much less contentious ground of, of minority government. Um, <laughs> And how this might affect the, the, the speaker's role. Um, you know, how do, how do you, um, does it put more pressure on you? How do you decide who to pick um, and, and so on to speak? How, how has it changed things? In formal terms, it doesn't change the role of the speaker. In informal terms, I think it does in the sense that it invests the selection of amendments with a greater importance than would otherwise be the case. Because obviously if it is a very tight parliament, the particular matter and form of words chosen for debate and vote mm. Mm. can be very important mm. Mm. in determining so the outcome how, of how, how, how do you choose uh, amendments and so on? How do you choose amendments? I think that you, you look at a number of factors nothing is completely concrete and conclusive. You know, I can't give you a an absolute guide, uh, there has to be an element of flexibility, but one key factor is level of support for an amendment reflected in the number of people who've put their names to it. Another key factor would be the breadth of support. Is there cross-party support for a particular amendment? Yeah. And I suppose a third might be a sense that the selection of the amendment would facilitate the House in disposing of an issue. And when I say disposing of an issue, I mean that almost in the technical sense, resolving an issue one way or the other. And needless to say, and it's a blindingly obvious point, but if I don't make it, somebody probably will, particularly a scholarly clerk, having consulted his scholarly cranium, the amendment has to be orderly. That is to say, it has to be technically correct. It has to be in order. Sometimes amendments are proposed which are of goodwill or worthy in other respects, but unfortunately they're sort of technically defective. So, I mean, it has to pass muster so far as the table office mm. is concerned, and I take advice from procedural experts on that front. But, you know, I come back to the point that if it's got substantial support, and particularly if it's got breadth of support, you know, that would be a good reason to consider choosing it. Mm. And one might also look, I don't say this is conclusive, but one might look at who are the people supporting an amendment? Because, you know, the seniority of members from across the House might be a factor. I don't say mm. that it would be mm. conclusive, mm. but it would be a factor. Mm. The government's told its MPs not to vote on opposition day uh, motions. I, uh, don't, don't bother. Do you think this deprives the opposition of one of its you know, best ways of making its point? Well, I think the opposition, Bronwyn, would probably say that yesterday, on the two matters chosen for opposition day mm. debates, tuition fees and the NHS, it did make its point. We are at an early stage in this controversy, if I can put it that way, because it has welled up over the last 24 hours. I can't recall a recent example of what happened yesterday. Opposition day debates can be effective even without votes and they can be effective on the basis of the passage of a vote. There's been quite a lot of media commentary about it, but I was in the chair for business questions today, and the Leader of the House, I think, twice said that people shouldn't believe everything that they read in the media, or indeed on Twitter. Now, I can think of one prominent journalist, who might even be here today, I think there was some suggestion that he would be, who obviously feels a pressing desire 
to report on this matter, but it seems to me that it would be better for me to talk to representatives of the government on this issue and perhaps mm. of the opposition rather than to conduct a discussion through the columns of a newspaper or an internet source. Which is not going to, within that sentence, be named, but all right. Um, thanks. We'll, we'll, we'll leave but, that but one But I out. would yeah. just say, yeah. sorry, I would just say, because uh, I, I genuinely don't want to be yeah. uh, oblique yeah. or to be ducking the issue. In essence, motions, ladies and gentlemen, can produce in Parliament orders or resolutions, or in certain circumstances, both. Motions that produce orders have to appertain to matters that are provided for, if you like, within the standing orders of the House, and they're judged to be matters which the House can direct to happen. For example, it's quite an old-fashioned instrument, but nonetheless legitimate for that, it is perfectly possible for the House in certain circumstances to pass a motion authorising, indeed ordering, a reduction in salary of an office holder, which is usually a way of expressing disapproval. This has happened from time to time, and that is effective, and votes on statutory instruments are effective, but a lot of votes in Parliament are expressions of opinion and are not necessarily binding. So we are in difficult and delicate terrain here, and I think it behoves me to proceed cautiously. But parliamentary votes do matter, mm -hmm. and I think it would be a very worrying development if they were to be treated lightly or disregarded. Thanks for that. Something the Institute's done a lot of work on is select committees and what makes them work well and what makes them um, effective and have some, some bite, if I can put it that way. Do you think they're getting better in your experience? I do. Yeah. I mean, I served on select committees myself in the past and I often mm. thought they did good mm. work and I saw other committees, committees of which I was not a member, that did mm. good work. Mm. I really do think, Bronwyn, that since 2010, the select committees have been more assertive, more independent-minded, mm. more rigorous, more demanding, more interrogative, more insistent, probably than ever before. Now, the academics amongst you might say, well, prove it, where's your evidence? You know, what empirical evidence have you got? And I admit that I can't offer you, you know, an empirical study. But what I would say is this, and I, other people take a different view, I'd be very interested to hear it. I think that the election of the chairs of select committees by secret ballot of the whole house which has happened since 2010 and since 2010 mm. the election by party caucus of the party's members of mm. those committees has made a dramatic difference i can't prove that there is a causal link between the democratic legitimacy conferred upon mm. the select committees and their chairs and the fact of their greater potency in the conduct of inquiries and the issue of reports but I just believe that to be demonstrably the case. And just to prove the point that I'm thinking across the House, because I think it's true across the House, and it's only a small number of examples, in the last Parliament, the Treasury Select Committee was brilliantly chaired by Andrew Tyree. And in my opinion, the Public Accounts Committee was brilliantly chaired by Margaret Hodge. McIlear is an extremely deserving and worthy successor to Margaret, but I give those as just two examples. There were other committees that did absolutely outstanding work. They really made a difference, as indeed the Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee did under the chairmanship of John Whittingdale and subsequently of Damien Collins. So, I mean, I think that they're more effective than ever before. Whether this is particularly convenient to the executive branch, you know, is another matter. But in the end, whether they know it or not, or whether they accept it or not, effective scrutiny by Parliament is in the interests of good government. Without it, it seems to me that the government is analogous to the driver of a fast car, driving at maximum speed, but with no brakes. So in the end, although it may be awkward for government, it's actually in the interests of good government to have a strong parliament and strong select committees. And I know Robin Cook would have agreed with that. Robin Cook, in my view, was an absolutely outstanding leader of the House. But if I think back to pre-2010, 
quintessential parliamentarian, Jack Straw, Jack was very much of that view. You know, he was mainly on the executive side. He was on the front bench for 30 years, and I think for what the last, virtually the last 18 years, or certainly the last 16 years of his time in Parliament, he was a minister, however long it was, 13 years perhaps it was. Anyway, and I think Jack thought it really mattered to have Parliament scrutinising what he did, and, and it was always to his credit, he was only one example, but it was always to his credit that he was always ready to, to come to the House. He yeah. never complained about being summoned to answer an urgent question. Mm. Let me jump back to some of the things you said right at the beginning about um, uh, about democracy. Yeah. Um, and I, I was curious whether you thought that in your time, people uh, this mood of anti-politics, um, dismissal of Parliament, lack of confidence in it, had got stronger, and, and uh, you know, and what then might be done about it. Yeah. Well, in a way, it's a curious fact, if it is a fact, that that should be so. I completely understand that there is huge disaffection from and with politics and the political class. But actually, as I think Tony Wright, who was the author of the Wright Report on Parliamentary mm. Reform, said a while ago, a couple of years ago, I think in an interview, Parliament is in rude health. Now, I'm not complacent. I think there are huge numbers of things that still need to be done to improve the workings of Parliament. We could go into that if there was time. But I don't actually accept that Parliament is in bad health. Witness what we've said about select committees. I think question time is more invigorating than before because of urgent questions. A, ministers have to come to the House and ministerial feet are held to the fire, but also backbenchers realise that they don't just have to go to a radio interview or a television studio to get their point across. There's almost UQs acting as a magnet to people to come to the chamber in the knowledge that they can contribute. I run exchanges on statements for longer than my predecessors. So instead of people thinking, oh dear, I didn't get in in the first half an hour and the speaker's about to end the statement, mm -hmm. I sometimes run statements for an hour, an hour and a half. I think I once had David Cameron at the dispatch box for mm -hmm. two and a half hours, which uh, probably explained why I was absent from his Christmas card list that year. But <laughs> nevertheless, I think it was an interesting time. So I think Parliament's in a good way, but there is still huge hostility to politics. I'm not complaining about this, it is a fact. I've lost count, Bronwyn, of the number of people I've met, including often very distinguished people in different walks of life, who use the words government and parliament as though they were synonyms of each other, uh, whereas in fact they're not. Yeah, okay, you know, we don't have a separation of powers, as in the US, so government ministers sit in parliament, but government ministers are a small minority of members of parliament. There are probably about 80 people in mm. parliament who are government ministers, and there are 650 MPs. An MP's role is to question, to probe, to scrutinise, to challenge, to contradict, sometimes even to expose the errors of omission or commission of the government today. What does Parliament need to do? I think there are a few things that we can do to make our, a number of things we can do to make our procedures better. I would throw out to you two off the top of my head. I think that just as we have a backbench business committee that chooses the business one day a week, I think we should have a house business committee, capital H, capital B, capital mm. C. I'm not suggesting, ladies and gentlemen, the government shouldn't get its business. If the government's got the votes, the government should get its business. My own view, however, is in this age in which transparency is more and more to the fore, and rightly so, decisions on what is debated, when and for how long, should not simply be made by the government chief whip and the opposition chief whip behind closed doors. I think it's better to have a house business committee with backbenchers on it and smaller parties represented, possibly meeting in public, though that may be too much for the powers that be to bear. It should probably be chaired by the senior deputy speaker. I'm not making some sort of, to, to coin a phrase, power grab here. Mm -hmm. It should be chaired by a deputy speaker. Ideally, it should result in the Leader of the House putting a proposition, perhaps even a votable proposition to the House each week mm. as to what the business should be. Mm. Parliament must take control of these matters. Mm. And, and by the way, while we're talking about taking back control, well, let's take back control you know, of our own procedures. And, and with all due respect, David Cameron and the coalition government committed to the introduction of the House Business Committee by the third year of the 2010 mm. to 15 Parliament. Now, I'm going to be charitable. I'm going to be charitable. I'm going to say that it was purely a failure of memory on the part of the government. Mm. They absent-mindedly neglected to bring forward this 
proposal. But I do remember once Peter Bone asking about it at question time. I think it was at PMQs. And whether because he misunderstood the question or because he chose to interpret it in a certain way, David Cameron started going on about the number of days that the backbench business committee had for debate, which was not what Peter was asking about. But anyway, Peter Bone called out, not enough. And very tellingly, the Prime Minister at the time said, more than enough. <laughs> and I then got the very clear sense that the government was resiling from that commitment. We ought to resurrect mm -hmm. that idea. That's the first point. And the second point is, for what it's worth, I think private members' bills should not be dealt with on a Friday and they should not be capable of being destroyed by being talked out. I'm not knocking individuals, Bronwyn. I'm actually a friend of Philip Davis. I regard Philip Davis. <laughs> I am actually a friend of his. I regard him with respect. He's an extremely capable parliamentarian, just as Eric, the late Eric Forth was a very capable par parliamentarian and was able to destroy private members' bills in an orderly way by making long speeches. But I don't think it's the right way to handle such business. I think we should have a dedicated slot for private members' bills, perhaps in the middle of the week, one or two a week or something like that. They should have an allocation of time to be debated, and then the House should vote on them, and they either proceed to committee stage or they're defeated. I think that old way of dealing with them, which persists, is bad for the reputation of Parliament. So those are a couple of changes, but we need to do you know, I mean, how long have you got? All right. So on, on that cue, we're actually going to stop, uh, stop there yep. because I know there are an awful lot of questions and on that particular theme and the others we could go on for a long time. Who'd like to start? All right. Let's go, let's go here in the front. Just on that last note, you should front. Okay. Can you, can you wait for, and if you could give your name as well? Yeah. Help. Sorry. My name's Emilio. I'm from Politics Home. Um, just on that last note, should Prime Minister's questions be an hour? <laughs> well, it's sometimes come quite close to being an hour by default, I readily admit. I think in the past, I've said I think that would be a good thing. I mean, I do remember, and this is not to his uh, discredit, I'm not saying this to knock him and he's not here to defend himself, but I do remember at the back end of 2009 having a, a meeting with David Cameron, you know, a few months before he became Prime Minister, and we touched on various possible reforms, and I did float to him the idea that he might be open to returning to PMQs twice a week, because he'd been very much against Tony Blair's unilateral decision to shift to once a week. And David Cameron said, with a little grin, well, you know, he would rather not do that, and he didn't intend to do that. And his reasoning was that even though it would only be uh, 15 minutes a time, it wouldn't involve more time. It would involve two lots of briefing, two lots of preparation. He said, so, you know, Mr. Speaker, it wasn't my decision to get rid of the twice a week, but now that it's been got rid of, you know, I don't intend to restore it. However, your question is, you know, could it take place once a week for an hour? I would very much favour that. Whether that's the will of the House, I don't know. And I'm open to criticism, people, of course, on everything, no doubt. P people could say, well, you know, why don't you adhere to the half an hour strictly? My attitude, my friends, is that if the Prime Minister chooses to open with some expression of condolence to someone who's lost his or her life, or reference to some tragedy that has taken place, or a terrorist outrage, or whatever it may be, uh, that's perfectly legitimate. I'm not remotely complaining about that at all. But I don't see why it should come out of Parliament's time. That's the first point. And the second point is that if there is quite a lot of disruption in the form of a lot of noise and heckling and I'm having to quieten people down, I remember for Helion and Yar yesterday, for example, who was getting very excited, well, I think there's much to be said for having some injury time. <laughs> and so, you know, I've tended to introduce injury time. No, it is, you know, it is open to criticism. I mean, I was told at one point that there was some broadcaster, I think it was, I'm trying to remember now, I think it was a broadcaster who was upset. I, I, it was not a programme I listened to my, or watched myself, but apparently it was, his programme tended to end with a sort of 10 or 15 minute round-up discussion of how Prime Minister's questions had gone and who'd done well and who hadn't and so on. But because I was running Prime Minister's questions on, it mucked up 
basically that yeah. opportunity for his programme to finish in that way. Well, it may come as an extraordinary surprise to a broadcaster who obviously yeah. tends to think that he occupies and indeed almost represents the very centre of the universe. But uh, the question of the convenience of the broadcaster wasn't a germane factor in my decision about how long to run yeah. Prime Minister's questions. You may think that's rather quaint, but there you go. So my feeling is the way it works now you know, it's not a bad thing. Just before the election, I, I admit I went longer than ever. And the reason I did that, which I thought the House wouldn't mind and on, on the whole would probably welcome, was that there was quite a large number of members standing down from Parliament who wanted to ask their last Prime Minister's question. Some of them have been in the House for decades. So, you know, it's open to criticism. But in a sense, what's the hurry? This is Parliament. And David Cameron very rarely complained, and I must say great credit to Theresa May, she's never complained to me about it. I've spoken to her, of course, from time to time during her tenure to date, and she's never complained to me about it. And I've found her, and I just make this point, whatever people's criticisms of her or of Jeremy Corbyn or any other political leader, I have found her nothing but courteous in our personal dealings. Thanks for that. Sorry, uh, uh, no, 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 it's another. If, if there's someone in the, uh, the annex room who wants to ask a question, please do. Don't be shy, but you will have to adopt the low-tech method of sticking your head around the door. Who is the said individual? Yeah. I'll do who it is. Right. Um, it's um, by the, right there by the door. Thank you. Robert Hazel from UCL and Hi, an Robert. associate here at the IFG. Um, you spoke about the external representation role. Can I ask a little bit more about internal leadership? Um, and about the governance of the House of Commons. It's a very important public institution. It spends public money. It's about to spend large sums of public money on the refurbishment programme. And do you think that the governance arrangements, primarily through the House of Commons Commission, are fit for purpose for running the institution and for managing very big projects of that kind? Uh, well, Robert, thank you for that question. I think they could be improved. I'm not sure that I would go so far as to say that they're unfit for purpose. I think the essential distinction between the House of Commons Commission and the successor body to the management board, the executive committee, is clear. The House of Commons Commission is the strategic governing body of the House and the executive committee has a much more operational focus. It is comprised of senior officers of the House and it gives effect to strategic decisions. But I think they could be improved. I think, without going into details or specifics, we probably need to consider again and be clear about the basis on which some matters do come to the House of Commons Commission and others do not, because there isn't a completely clear dividing line. We do have important committees in the House, ladies and gentlemen, the Finance Committee, the Administration Committee, and so on. But there are matters that can sometimes prove, if not at the time of initial decision, later quite controversial, for example, relating to the Elizabeth Tower, which didn't actually come for substantive discussion to the House of Commons Commission. And I think at the very least it's worth considering, you know, what comes to us, what's the basis on which the decision is made. As far as something as big as restoration and refurbishment is concerned, I think that if we were on the House of Commons Commission presuming to lead the way on that matter, that would be very ambitious on our part. But I think in practice, we do recognise that if that project were to go ahead, it would almost certainly require a delivery authority. And that delivery authority would have to be comprised of people with relevant and probably top-level experience of delivering on similar such projects. Would I consider myself competent to lead on a thing of that kind? No. And I think if my colleagues were honest on it, the matter, and I'm sure they would be, most members of the Commission would not be competent to lead on that matter. The only other point I would make, uh, Robert, you will no doubt be well familiar with this issue, but there may be other people here who are not, is this. Not everybody agrees with me about this, I completely accept. I think that the change that we made a couple of years ago 
whereby the clerk of the house, though remaining head of the house service, is not the chief executive, was a good change. Let me acknowledge that when we had a row about the appointment of the clerk of the house back in 2014, I made mistakes. Uh, I did not handle it as well as I should have done. I won't bore you with all that now unless people particularly want to ask about it. But I stand by my central proposition that the clerks who are brilliant staff of the house, and I hugely value, are fantastic at procedure. And it is also true that they do undertake management tasks, as some of them have had occasion to point out to me. You know, they're not purely proceduralists. They do do management and they manage staff. But they don't have, in any real sense, serious management expertise. They don't have project management expertise. They don't have ex expertise in the delivery of services. They are procedural specialists. And that is incredibly valuable. But I would argue that they should stick to their last, if I can put it mm -hmm. that way. And what we need is a, another cadre of people whose expertise is not in parliamentary procedure, who may know nothing about parliamentary procedure, but have got experience of running things. Mm -hmm. And my view is that the arrangement now, whereby we have David Nartzler, who's an absolutely stellar brain, as Clark is great because David Nartzer is extremely well informed, his advice is sober, he's utterly committed. I found him a really faithful ally and he, you know, he's a huge credit to the House of Commons and a great clerk. Mm. But we have a Director General of the House, Ian Ailes, who's got a commercial background and I think that change, though it was the subject of controversy and there were some traditionalists who didn't want to change the arrangement, I absolutely stand by my view that that needed to change and I'm very grateful to the Straw Committee for agreeing that there should be a change and to the House for endorsing that change. The House is starting to be better managed though I still think there's a long way to go. Okay, th th thanks. There's a lot of questions I'm going to take to. Um, here at the front Roger. and then over there at the side. Uh, Thank you. John, in six years working Could in Parliament, you are, Ian Corby, in six years, I, I worked for Parliament in six years, and it took me 18 months to set up an LGBT group in Deloitte. It took me 18 seconds with you to persuade you that we should have an LGBT w employment group. So thank you for that. On a more serious note, um, do you think we've seen the death of, with the exception of personal indiscretion, individual ministerial responsibility? And as we look forward to the outcome of the Grenfell Inquiry, what well, we may discover the, the Grenfell inquiry yeah. we may discover that there was a whole series of mistakes such that the overall system was at fault uh, do you think that there's still a place for individual ministerial responsibility well uh, first of all thank you for your kind remarks about the establishment of a parliamentary group on LGBT rights by the way we have a series Which is of serious it just it just it wasn't a question but um, sorry we do have a series of workplace equality networks and I think that's an extremely positive thing. We have Parley Out, Parley Able, Parley Agenda, Parley Reach, and, and you know, I think the House is a more welcoming place than it used to be, and I, I'm proud of the fact that we host events in Speaker's House for Stonewall and for the Kaleidoscope Trust and, and so on, and, you know, the Albert Kennedy Trust, and long may that continue to be the case. It's not an accident, as you know, that I have in my coat of arms the rainbow symbol, the equality symbol, and the pink triangle, you know, I'm a straight ally of the LGBT cause and I'm not embarrassed about that. The fact that it also upset the Daily Mail is obviously an additional <laughs> gain. And now, as to your... Ministerial responsibility. Do the, we have ministerial responsibility? Should we? Yes, we should. I mean, the question of who carries the can or whether a minister carries the can, you know, depends on the circumstances of the case. It used to be much more common, of course, and many of you here will be familiar with the Critchell Down affair and the resignation of Thomas Dugdale in 1954. Uh, you're all sort of looking very serious. You obviously remember this very keenly. And uh, if not from personal experience, at any rate, from your reading of the history books, uh, I think it is important that there should be individual ministerial responsibility. Now, that's not for the Speaker to guarantee, but it is, I think, for the Speaker to ensure that whoever's in government, if a minister is under pressure, Parliament should always treat a minister with courtesy, and the Speaker certainly should, but it's not the Speaker's job to protect a minister from legitimate, painstaking, and possibly quite relentless and ferocious inquisition. Now, whether that will arise in the context of Grenfell, I don't know. But 
Parliament must have an opportunity to get to the bottom of that matter. As Parliament, in a different context, had the opportunity to get to the bottom of the issue relating to phone hacking, which wasn't particularly about ministers, but more about News International and the police and some journalists, and Parliament had an opportunity to get to the bottom of the Hillsborough disaster. I think that that has been a triumph of the last few years. And, you know, I don't want to think in terms of ministers falling on their swords as being a triumph, and I'm not suggesting any minister will need to fall on his or her sword, but Parliament should have the opportunity to say whether it thinks that should happen. Great, thank you. It's one over here and then come in. Thank you. My name's John Cartledge. Um, you've, re you've referred to your desire to modernise parliamentary procedure and make the institution fit for the challenges that it has to face in the present day. We now have four legislatures in this country. Three of them are unicameral, and nobody has ever suggested that they need a second chamber to crawl over the decisions of the first, because the first are in some way likely to be found wanting. So Westminster is now the odd one out. Mm. I don't know whether you feel in a position to offer any public comment about the continuing utility of a second chamber at Westminster and whether it offers any value for money that can be justified in these days of austerity. Beautifully put. That is uh, a beautiful really, really, question. A, a really interesting question. Yeah. It is a really yeah. interesting question. And I used to say, by the way, that when I was free to express views on this matter, the record showed that I had voted for <laughs> an either a wholly or a predominantly elected second chamber, but now that I'm not free to express such views, you know, I leave you to deduce from my past statements what might be my current thinking. But I do think that that is altogether too coy. And as you've asked me such a beautiful question and so beautifully constructed, I think you, I owe you an honest answer. You're right that we're the odd one out within the UK, but the UK Parliament is the Parliament for the whole of the United Kingdom. And my view, for what it's worth, is that there is real value in having a second chamber. The question of how it's constituted you know, is another matter. I did favour an elected second chamber, but I do think that if you were wondering whether you should bet money on there being an elected second chamber any time soon, I would urge the merits of prudence and advise you to be rather cautious because I don't think that matter is going to be sorted out a week next Tuesday or even particularly likely to be sorted out in this parliament when there are other very pressing concerns. And I suppose what I would say is that in the last parliament there was no clear codification of powers in the House of Lords bill or delineation of functions. And in my opinion that was a considerable error by the coalition government. What they kept saying was, oh, don't worry, if we pass this bill, the House of Commons will still be the primary chamber. But that was what I would call argument by advocacy rather than argument by evidence. If they had clearly delineated the functions or codified the powers, that might have offered some assurance, some assurance to people who were worried mm. that an elected second chamber was going to destroy or undermine the power of the first. So I don't think reform on any major scale is going to happen any time soon. And I think the terms of the debate have shifted a bit. To put it very simply, I think delaying powers and review powers are important, and I do favour the existence of a second chamber. But forgive me saying so, one can argue the toss about the size of the House of Commons. But as far as the size of the House of Lords is concerned, it is frankly patently absurd that the House of Lords is significantly larger than the House of Commons. Now, I don't say that in a spirit of machismo or sort of personal or institutional pride, still less willy-waving, <coughs> that we have to be bigger than them, you know, because otherwise our pride is punctured. We are the elected chamber. There's a very good argument, in my opinion, for having a second chamber which gives pause for thought, says, might you reconsider? Will you look at this alternative? Could you conceive of the possibility that you were wrong or that circumstances have now proved you to be wrong? And I think that's a good argument for having a second chamber. But should it consist of 800 plus members? Absolutely not. I mean, it could most definitely be halved in size. And I think most people would say, I think most fair-minded people would say that it should be. Thank you. <laughs> Forgive me, uh, in the doorway, and then I'll come to you. Good afternoon, Julie Meller. Hi, Julie. Hi. Uh, given you have been such a great 
um, advocate and uh, champion of citizen understanding of our democracy in your role as speaker. And given the lack of trust in politics and body politics um, uh, that exists from the public, do you think that citizens' juries could be an effective way, or citizens' juries commissioned by select committees could be a powerful adjunct to evidence to select committee inquiries, particularly on issues that require deliberation because they're complex and require trade-offs over scarce resources, for example? If you mean, Julie, forgive me, citizens' juries that would sit for the duration of the inquiry, I do think that there would be real merit in that. It would be another form, ladies and gentlemen, of public evidence taking, I suppose. Whether it would be desirable or even likely that the select committees would seek to establish you know, what might be called standing, i.e. ongoing, enduring, citizens' juries, I don't know. But no, citizens' juries, uh, I understand from your body language, you're not of assent, for the duration of the inquiry. Yes, I think that that could be a really useful adjunct. Look, there's always a balance to be struck here, ladies and gentlemen. You, know, you may think, gosh, he sounds rather proud of Parliament. I hope I am proud of the good developments in Parliament. But there's a difference between being proud and being satisfied. If you ask me, am I proud of the way my parliamentary colleagues discharge their obligations? I am. I think that Parliament is made up of some absolutely fantastic people who work extremely hard, very dedicated to the public interest, and are people in very large numbers of cases of quite exceptional ability and qualities. But am I satisfied with the way Parliament's working? No. I think that we should always be thinking, how can we do it better? And, you know, I, frankly, I rather like your idea. Here in the front. Yeah. Thanks. Hello, Bonnie Sands, Women's Parliamentary Radio. Thank you for helping set us up 12 years ago during your other advisory board. I've got a question about behaviour in the chamber. We have a record 208 women in Parliament, yeah. yet the sexism and catcalling is as bad as it ever was, yeah. particularly what happened to Leila Moran two weeks ago yes. at PMQs, which you called out. Do you wish, and please be honest, yeah. that you had a yellow card system so that you could send people out of the chamber? Come I would on, rather honest. welcome that. Right. If I'm honest about it, yes, I would rather welcome that. And again, you know, I, I don't want to flagellate myself. There are plenty of people who would probably undertake to perform the task, uh, whether I wanted it or not. So, you know, I'm not really sort of prostrating myself before you and saying how awful things are. But, you know, as I have talked in answer to Bronwyn's questions and to yours about things that I think that we've done that have worked and things that I think I can boast have been successes, let me say that in relation to Prime Minister's questions, the record has not been successful. You know, I started out with the intention of trying to bring about reform of Prime Minister's questions in a number of respects, possibly length, possibly having a mixture of spontaneous questions and what we call substantive questions of which the PM would have advance notice, which would mean it was less spontaneous, but you might get more informative answers. But I did also start out with the intention of trying to improve conduct at PMQs. And I think if you were to research, and if you didn't, Crick would probably do it on your behalf, you would see that I did at one time make a speech about a possible traffic light system in relation to Prime Minister's questions. And in fact, we haven't really made progress on the matter. Now, why is that? I think it is mainly because the Speaker has only got power to deal with the manifestations of disorder, and uh, the Speaker can ask a particular member to calm down or to behave or make some jocular or less jocular reference to that member, or the Speaker can extend the session. The Speaker could suspend the sitting, but then that would probably be written up as evidence that the Speaker had lost control and that it was a great crisis. And so on. Obviously, the scribblers have got to have something to scribble. And so I think that it would be better if the Speaker actually had the power to deal with that matter. There was at one time, a, I think, a report by a group of female members of Parliament. I remember Mary MacLeod, the former member for Brentford and Isleworth, was involved. And they did produce a report at one stage suggesting that the Speaker should have greater powers to deal with disorder. And Sarah Childs, in her Good Parliament report, has recommended that there should be changes. So, you know, I would be keen on that. But the truth is twofold. There will only be an improvement in behaviour in one or other of two circumstances. One is if the 
whips offices on both sides of the house clearly instruct their MPs to stop the catcalling, stop the sort of ad hominem abuse, and say, yeah, by all means, cheer our leader when he or she comes in, but I don't want, the chief whip should say, I do not want this level of disruption. Then, if that happened, behaviour would change. And so you can draw your own conclusions. Behaviour hasn't changed, presumably because the whip's offices haven't wanted it to happen. They want a wall of noise, and I think that's a great pity. And, and the second circumstance in which it would change would be if the Speaker were given formal powers. I don't have a power to deal with sexism, but do I think it's lamentable? I do. I think it's absolutely lamentable. And I did my best spontaneously to help Leila Moran. Whether I did it particularly well or not is another matter, but I was trying to be helpful to her because I thought she was disgracefully treated. Let me just make one further point, and that is this. It's, you may think it's a slightly distant point, but it's this. Shortly before I became Speaker, the House voted for the right of the UK Youth Parliament to have an annual sitting for the remainder of that Parliament, and since it's become the norm, each year on the green benches on a non-sitting Friday, and that now happens as a matter of course. I voted for that, and then shortly afterwards I became Speaker, and I discovered the Deputy Speaker was going to chair the session, and that was because Michael Martin tended to prefer, or did prefer, to be in Scotland on a Friday. So Alan Hazelhurst was going to chair the Youth Parliament. I decided to say to Alan, Alan, you spend the day in Saffron Walden in your constituency, I'm going to chair it, for two reasons. First, I thought I'd enjoy it, but more particularly, I thought if we want to be respected by young people, we must show respect for young people. A senior member who has since retired came up to me florid of face, puce in fact, and spitting almost inadvertently at me. I said, Mr. Speaker, he said, is it true as I have been advised that you are going to chair the session of the UK Youth Parliament in the Chamber of the House? To which, as you know, I am very much opposed. And I said, yes, it's absolutely true. Let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, sir, he said, I have been here very considerably longer than you have. And I said, no, no, I don't know exactly when you came into the house. What's your point? He said, it's going to be an absolute disaster. At the very least, chewing gum will be left all over the chamber. And at the worst, pen knives will be used and damage will be inflicted on these benches, which I love. And I said to him, I completely disagree with you. I think that is a monstrous calumny on the members of the UK Youth Parliament. And I make this prediction to you. They will be proud to come, they'll speak well, and they'll behave a damn sight better than we do. And forgive me, but I say on behalf of the UK Youth Parliament, whose business I've chaired, whose session sitting I've chaired every year since 2009, and I've gone to their conference every year, wherever it's been in the UK, to speak to them and answer their questions since 2009, I was right on all three counts. And, you know, it seems to me that rigorous scrutiny, passion, now and again explosions of anger, are perfectly in order. There's nothing new about that. You can't expect to conduct PMQs in silence. We're not a group of Trappist monks or an Oxford Union debating society. But when the decibel level causes Deep Purple, which was the loudest band in the world in the 1970s, to be regarded as positively sotto voce, we're spray painting our shop window. The public, I genuinely believe, the public don't like it. So Bonnie Soans has issued the call for a change to the culture of PMQs and an end to sexism. And I agree with that. And by the way, you know, people are entitled to their opinions, robust opinions on the issues. But you know, let's treat each other with a degree of respect. And there are some reports in the newspapers today of comments about uh, the Prime Minister you know, from a former colleague, which I find quite extraordinary. Not in the chamber, in, 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 in the uh, newspaper. Uh, you know, uh, no, I don't know whether those comments are accurate or not, but, and people must answer for themselves. But you know, a basic level of human respect is in order. And I, I think Leila Moran was very, very, very wrongly treated. But I can only deal with matters that are within my powers. Mm. Uh, I, know we're late. I don't mind taking a few more if you want, but not if you don't. She's in, uh, Bromwood is in charge. You just get a sense of hands. We're running into quite formal okay. structures of the IFG, known okay. as our Sorry. board meeting, okay. um, coming, okay, coming soon. Let me, let me thank you for that. Let me just uh, then, uh, if people want to make their points very quickly, yeah. one at the back and one here. 
really quickly and thank you for that generosity. If people have to leave, that's absolutely fine. We'll finish in five minutes. Okay. Thank you. My name is Bridget Micklum. Um, Bridget. I have a, Micklum. Thank you. I have a question relating actually to um, the way the speaker is elected um, in the constituency. Okay. Um, as, as people will know, there is a convention that the speaker's constituency is, con is not contested uh, by major parties. Um, at the last election, there were 20,000 spot ballots, and you said that on your um, acceptance speech that you reflected, that you would reflect on the message that seemed to send. It yeah. seems to me that as a, a champion and reforming uh, speaker, I would like just to find out where your thinking has got to on, on that question, because it seemed to me that there was some distress in the constituency and I am a, one of your constituents. So thank you. Okay. It's thank you very much for that. And indeed, John, a second thanks for the extra time. And, um, and, okay. there, was a, and there was another one here. There's a squeeze in both. I will come back on that, of course, yeah. Bridget. Thank you. Uh, Michael Crick, yesterday, uh, Channel 4 News. Um, on what you said about yesterday, would it be fair to say that you would be disappointed if this was to happen on a regular basis, that the government, uh, that the government allows opposition motions to just sail through with no vote. Thank you. Uh, Bridget, uh, first of all, in response to your question, I don't want to cavil, and I will attend to the point as best I can, but there weren't 20,000 spoiled ballot papers in the Buckingham constituency in 2017. There were 2,000, you know, which is slightly different. So what would I say about it? The issue has come up a number of times. I pledged in 2010, after the poll then, at the declaration of poll to ask the procedure committee to look at it and they did and they recommended no change I did as you rightly say reiterate that commitment at the count or immediately following the count in June of this year and I will ask the procedure committee to look at it in essence ladies and gentlemen Bridget obviously is well familiar with the issue the point is this the speaker upon assumption of office as speaker is expected immediately to eschew party politics thereafter and on the 22nd of June 2009 when I was elected speaker that evening I resigned as a member of the Conservative Party writing to Eric Pickles the chairman of the party to that effect and that was consistent with the expectation that the speaker frees him or herself from party politics however the house wants the speaker to be a sitting MP exercising similar responsibilities to other MPs staging surgeries representing a constituency and so the House has traditionally not wanted the Speaker to be a kind of ex officio member of the House, representing what is sometimes described as a St. Stephen's constituency, just named after the St. Stephen's entrance to the House. It is occasionally suggested that the Speaker could do that. The Speaker could become an ex officio member of the House of Commons, representing what really, to be honest, would be a rotten borough, but that then the constituency of the Speaker could conduct a normal election. Now, the House could decide that that should happen and if the House decides that in due course so be it. I have not been a cheerleader for that change because I don't think that the argument is clear cut. I completely understand that there are some people who say they feel disenfranchised and I understand the point that there isn't a full party choice because the parties generally respect this convention so I just had a UKIP and a Green opponent and a local independent in 2017 and in 2015 I just had a UKIP and a Green opponent not major party opponents so I stand as the speaker seeking re-election. One thing I am insistent on and you may disagree is I absolutely can represent the constituency. The idea that the Speaker can't represent his constituency, in my view, is flawed. The Speaker represents his constituency, Bronwyn colleagues, in a manner analogous, not absolutely identical, but analogous to the way in which a minister represents his constituency. A minister speaks in the House from the dispatch box as a minister, nothing else. A minister doesn't speak in the chamber as a backbench MP about local constituency issues. The Speaker likewise speaks in the chamber only as speaker and i don't speak about back buckingham matters in the chamber but just as ministers represent their constituents in correspondence and in meetings with their ministerial colleagues that's what i do as speaker and i tend to get quicker and fuller replies from ministers to my letters now than i got before i became speaker and if i want to see a minister the minister without fail has always come to speaker's house to see me. So I certainly believe I can represent the constituency. Yes, there is some feeling about the matter. I am asking the Procedure Committee to look at it again, and they will do so. But if you're asking me, you know, do I plan to lobby or 
pressurise them to take a particular view? No, but I will ask Charles Walker and his colleagues on the Procedure Committee to consider the issue, and it is then for them to take forward as they think fit. Finally, Michael, yes. would I be disappointed? Yes, I mean, Dunning Street was suggesting this is given that on a fairly regular basis. Well, Michael, you've got a puckish grin on your face, and I mean, I don't want to suggest that you're a troublemaker, but some people think that <laughs> you and trouble are not sort of unadjacent to each other. Yes, indeed, I know. Yes, I know. I think you're thinking of pots and kettles. Well, I think it would be a matter of widespread concern if, on a regular basis, votes by Parliament came to be disregarded. But I do point out to you, I don't know whether you'll stop writing at this point because this point is of less interest to you, but as you're a scrupulously fair um, remorselessly diligent journalist, I'm sure you won't stop writing at this point, and this will be of interest to you. The Leader of the House indicated at business questions today that people shouldn't believe everything that they read in the newspapers or hear on Twitter. So I think I owe the government the courtesy of hearing what the government has to say to me on that matter, because this all arose yesterday, and it hasn't been the subject of a discussion between me and Andrea Leadsom or between me and the government chief whip. So. You know, I think it would be a matter of widespread concern if that were to happen, but as to whether it will and whether the government even intends it to be so, I do think you know, I would like to hear from them themselves. But Thank I you. do repeat the point that I think parliamentary votes are important. Thank you very much. We have Andrea Leadsom here this evening. We'll put that point to her. Uh, John Burko, thank you very much indeed for coming. Thanks for your questions.